the love for offshore sailing in France is, you know, undeniable. The Rolex Fastnet is steeped in mystique for the French. It has to evolve, and the club has, has made a great decision in coming to Sherbrooke. Oui, c'est un vrai nouveau chapitre, effectivement, qui s'ouvre pour la Fastnet Race. Ce changement de parcours, c'est arrivé en France. C'est un renouveau, ça va donner euh, du souffle à cette course de légende. Je trouve ça positif. It never stops really all the way to the finish. You can never rest really. So there's always something to plan, something to be cautious of. Yeah, it's, a, it's a full package. The Rolex Fastnet race needs to get better known in, in France. This race deserves it. I think Normandy is spectacular. Obviously, a lot of history here for both sides of the channel, and, and to come and bring the race to finish here, it adds an, an excitement that we may not have got anywhere else. Establishing new frontiers is a familiar idea in France. And when the Royal Ocean Racing Club, now celebrating a 20-year partnership with Rolex, looked at alternative venues to berth a growing Fastnet entry list, its plans were always likely to be warmly received by sailors across the channel. The rationale for moving to Cherbourg started a long time ago when the race's popularity meant that we were struggling to accommodate all the people who wanted to do the race. And we were looking for somewhere that would accommodate them in one place, close to the city centre, and Cherbourg has all that. Je trouve ça une belle image euh, que les, les Anglais et les Français euh, réussissent à travailler ensemble et de, grâce à, à travers cette, ce Fastnet Race de pouvoir euh, relier deux nations maritimes qui ont dans l'histoire développé euh, la, la course au large et euh, voilà, de partir d'Angleterre, euh, arriver en France, c'est une bonne solution. French boats have won the overall title in three of the last four editions of the race. This time, though, they'll step ashore afterwards onto French soil. For most of its length, the new course retains the tidal traps and challenges of the old, traversing the headlands of southern England before heading out across the Celtic Sea to the Fastnet Rock off the southwestern tip of Ireland. Instead of turning left at the Scilly Isles for Plymouth on the return, the fleet heads straight on to Cherbourg, adding another 87 nautical miles to the adventure. For once, changes to COVID travel rules have kept the size of the fleet assembling in cows in check. Apart from Scorpios, that is. A Club Swan 125, owned by Dmitry Ribolovlev, she's 140 feet long and the event's largest ever entry. Launched just two months ago, Scorpios is making her competitive debut. The quantity of resources that the owner has put into this project to be able to face the starting night of the Fastnet is just incredible. But now it's time to see how far we can go. It's impressive the potential and the, the performance that in this short time is showing with light and, and medium winds, but I believe that it will take time to see the real potential of this boat in, in British conditions. Time is perhaps the one commodity that nearest rival Rambler has on its side. Tried, tested, and nothing if not tenacious, George David's crew returns in search of their third consecutive line on us title. If it starts to blow really hard, like 30s, we might have an edge because we've been at this with the same team, with the same boat now. This is the sixth year. And so this boat is it's pretty optimized and it's pretty well sailed. The Club Swan 125 is quite a bit longer than we are. It's got a lot of stability and it will go really fast on most points of sail. You have to realize Scorpios is a big boat. Strong southwesterly winds have been barreling up the channel for the last 72 hours. Race day is no different. Leaving the sanctuary of the marinas in Cowes is a 337 boat fleet representing 24 nations. For some, the 35 knot headwinds and heavy sea state will create some of the toughest conditions they've ever faced. Take it out, 
this is the big one and what a start for it. Pretty punchy, out here. It's an interesting way to start the race. We haven't seen it like this for a while. The first start in the Rolex Fastnet Race 2021 will be the multi-hulls. First out of the blocks is Maxi Edmond de Rothschild, a co-skipper's back to defend their cherished title. La Rolex Fastnet, c'est une course de légende que tout le monde peut faire. Et ce qui est assez génial, c'est que ça mélange aujourd'hui les amateurs, les professionnels. Donc, il n'y a pas beaucoup de sports où tous les amateurs et professionnels peuvent se retrouver sur un même événement. Here comes Scorpius in towards us, but it's Glambler closer to the line. Moved up the starting sequence on safety grounds are the largest monohulls, to the relief of their owners and skippers. This is our biggest concern. We need to go out of the saline, going up in 13 to 14 knots. Everybody's going to try to go into the channel and it will create a very complicated situation. And at the same time, we cannot lose time with Rambler, so we need to find a good combination and balance. as they head towards the squadron. Crews in classes further down the fleet share the same anxieties. In the Solent, in these conditions, the challenges come thick and fast, an early test of a boat's integrity and her crew's resolve. Hearst Castle, it's, it's like a funnel, so there's this huge amount of water moving for a very narrow gap, and that creates standing waves, and we had wind over tide, so it was about as scary as it can be. At the Needles, Scorpios holds a narrow advantage over Rambler. There's one of many class rivalries to be played out all the way down the fleet in the days to come. Ahead of the fleet is a tough and attritional 24 hours. The wind and waves of the Solent, a brutal reminder of the challenge the Rolex Fastnet race presents from the start, with a new page in its evolving story about to be written. Among the boats tackling the gusting headwinds is Kai Gretens Oromokto, a recently refurbished one-tonner and first-time entrant from Kiel in northern Germany, built in 1971. My grandfather used to race in Germany on the German races, Kiel Week and North Sea Week. Actually, I was on the boat 76 the first time myself, being uh, seven years old. So I know the boat inside out, and that's a big advantage, I think. Like several other entries, the boat has already completed a journey of hundreds of miles from its home port just to make the start line. The boat has a 50-year anniversary. Uh, it sailed a lot north to Norway and Sweden and Finland and Poland, but never sailed west. And uh, Rolex Fastest is a perfect target to go to. And it's so exciting as I never sailed in this water myself as well, so a lot of new things. But I think we managed fine and we enjoy. The fleet is experiencing the full force of the southwesterly headwinds, which have already forced several retirements. On the Volvo 70 Ocean Breeze, conditions are anything but. And on Rambler, life is no less challenging. Less troubled by the conditions and making short work of the fetch across the Celtic Sea are the largest multi-hulls. Setting a scorching pace as the runaway leader is Maxi Edmond de Rothschild, aided by a new foil package developed since their win in 2019. Struggling to keep up is Thomas Coville's Sedebo Ultime 3. followed by Yves Leblevec's team on Actual. At 8 a.m. on day two, 
Maxi Edmond de Rothschild rounds the fabled turning mark just under 21 hours since leaving cows. Camar and Cordrelier are not the only French sailors determined to retain their title. Since winning the overall trophy in 2013 with his father Pascal, the first double-handed entry to do so, Alexis Loison has won the two-handed class in three of the last four races, a record securing him local hero status in his hometown. C'est vrai que notre victoire en 2013, toutes catégories confondues, elle a, elle a fait beaucoup de bruit à Cherbourg et partout dans le monde. Et puis voilà, c'est mon père depuis que je suis petit me parle du Fastnet. Donc, euh, donc de la remporter comme ça, euh, c'était incroyable. Et j'espère que ça a donné euh, envie à d'autres équipages en double de, de faire la même chose, parce qu'on voit que le, le double est de plus en plus euh, demandé sur ces courses. Et on, on se dit que c'est un peu quand même à cause de nous. <rire> Ma ville d'adoption, c'est Cherbourg. Je suis arrivé là, j'avais 4 ans. J'ai appris à naviguer dans la rade et, et aux alentours. Voilà, donc euh, c'est mon, mon terrain de jeu. Le niveau euh, cette année en double euh, a jamais été aussi relevé. A voir, moi je, me, euh, je, je pense que ça va être très dur de la gagner à nouveau. Voilà, après euh, on s'est très bien préparé cette année avec euh, Guillaume Pirouel en Figaro. On a quand même fait énormément de courses en double, euh, notamment une transat. Le plus important c'est d'avoir un duo qui se connaît parfaitement, ce qui va être le cas entre, euh, entre nous. Among the sailors ranged against them on the other side of the channel is Shirley Robertson, best known as a double Olympic gold medalist, but now a committed convert to competitive short-handed sailing. Once you start double-handed offshore sailing, it's really addictive. You know, there's this amazing intensity, like you never stop. Robertson is teaming up with Volvo Ocean Race sailor Henry Bombi, well aware of the size of the task they're tackling. It's a massive deal taking on the Fastnet. You know, we've been preparing for it for two years. It's a really incredible test of, of seamanship, of decision making, of teamwork. And all of that actually is, is quite daunting. In the 24 hours since the fleet's dramatic departure, winds have slowly eased, undermining Rambler's efforts to overhaul Scorpios. The fetch across the Celtic Sea has left George David's crew some 40 nautical miles adrift, and well outside their record-setting pace in more favorable conditions two years ago. At 6 p.m. on day two, Scorpios is the first monohull to reach Fastnet Rock. Rounding 30 hours and 38 minutes after departure, also some four hours outside Rambler's Mark, but still a stunning spectacle. Rambler's approach is more poignant. It's now a decade since the earlier Rambler 100 lost her keel and capsized shortly after rounding the rock pitching her owner, his wife, and three other crew members into the heavy swell. But was upside down in 50 seconds. Everybody survived, which was truly remarkable, including five people with three hours and two minutes in the water. Of course, this is the 10th anniversary. That's a special reason to be back here. Every single person is sailing again. I still get a little emotional, because people should have died. At the other end of the racetrack, just minutes earlier, Maxi Edmond de Rothschild arrives in Cherbourg to retain her multi-hull line honors title, requiring little more than a day, nine hours and 15 minutes to complete the new course. Hey, 
oui, bah, très content effectivement de, de, de venir dans cette ambiance à Cherbourg. Et on sait qu'en France, la, la voile est, est, est un sport très, euh, très connu. Et, et euh, aujourd'hui, le public présent prouve encore que c'est très sympa de faire des arrivées en France. Donc il faut continuer. <rire> Crews approaching the final section of the new race course have one potentially calamitous obstacle to negotiate. Running close to the nominal race route and between Alderney and Cap de la Hague on the tip of the Cotentin Peninsula, the Ras Blanchard for sailors can be a soul-destroying, boat-breaking body of water. The current here flows at up to 12 knots depending on tide and time of year, the strongest anywhere in Europe. La spécificité de ce site, euh, c'est bah, évidemment son implantation géographique. On se retrouve à la rencontre des deux masses d'eau euh, de, au niveau des rencontres de courant euh, entre la basse mer et la pleine mer. Et en plus, la bathymétrie des, des fonds ici font qu'on passe de profondeur assez importante au niveau de la fosse de la Hague sur des petits fonds euh, sur les abords de Goury. Le plus dangereux ici, c'est quand le vent est contre la marée, en fait, parce que là, pour du coup, ça lève la mer beaucoup plus important. L'effet de, de vent va renforcer la houle et en plus, du coup, la, la houle n'est pas régulière. On va avoir des houles croisées qui peuvent arriver un peu de tous les sens. C'est très court, très haut. Pour, toute cette, pour la Rolex Fastnet, on sera évidemment en alerte, comme on l'est de toute façon euh, tout le reste de l'année. For some crews, the Raz is the last roll of the dice. Winners benefit from a slingshot effect, losers stop or go backwards. En fait, euh, au niveau, pour, le, pour le passage du Raz Blanchard, qui va être une partie euh, vraiment tactique de cette course, il faut vraiment s'adapter à la situation, à la météo et à l'heure à laquelle on arrive. Breakfast on the fly with jam and jelly and honey and good coffee. Cheers. Up ahead of Oromocto, Alexis Loison and Guillaume Pirouel on Léon are vying for the lead in IRC3 and the two-handed fleet with three other boats. Shirley Robertson and Henry Bombay Swell currently not among them. Loison's hopes of a triumphal arrival in Cherbourg remain on hold. For the race debutante, though, they're soon to become reality. Just a few weeks after taking delivery of the boat, Fernando Ecovari's crew on Scorpios take Monohull line honours in the Rolex Fastnet race. On her first competitive outing, we are very happy because we achieved our targets. That was uh, competing the Fastnet and finish the Fastnet, and with uh, this uh, great result, so it's been a win-win situation. So we are so so happy. They've taken two days, eight hours, and 33 minutes to complete the new course and establish the mark to beat in two years' time. Rambler's challenge ends in further disappointment. George David's men receive a did-not-sail course classification for a navigational error after rounding Fastnet Rock with the exclusion zone to starboard instead of to port. Like all the best crews, they win together and they lose together. I'm not concerned about this uh, outcome. It is what it is. We sailed a great race. That's a simple fact on the water. And I think also we should remind ourselves that not everything in life is perfect. It's a great team is what it is, and that's every single participant. Yeah, thanks, thanks for putting George. it all together, George. Among the boats to finish the following afternoon is Tala, a comfortable winner on corrected time in IRC-1. It's also cut and dried in IRC2, where one boat alone has managed to stay ahead of the ridge of high pressure ensnaring its rivals. 
Just after 10 a.m. on day five, Sunrise, the JPK 1180 race by Thomas Neen, crosses the line in Cherbourg to win her class and stake a strong claim for the overall title, her nearest class rival over 120 miles behind. It's much tighter in IRC3 and the two-handed class, where Shirley Robertson and Henry Bombay on swell now hold a narrow lead, both on the water and on corrected time, over perennial class winner Alexis Loison's Leon. So, sunset, this will be our fifth night uh, in the race. We are about 30 miles from the finish, and you can see it, it's really light. Uh, Leon, we can see, is closing fast about three miles to windward, so um, we're doing what we can, we'll see what happens. Exiting the Ras Blanchard in a final roll of the dice, Leon jibes further south to stay closer to the Cotentin coast in a bid to squeeze ahead on corrected time. Alexis Loison's local knowledge eventually pays dividends. In one of the tightest struggles anywhere in the fleet, Leon wins IRC3 and the two-handed class by just 36 minutes. C'est vraiment super de, bah, de gagner encore et, et surtout euh, à Cherbourg. Quoi. My first fast night done like that. I mean, it was so intense. I feel like we've raced around the planet, <laughs> and, and to be right in the thick of it, battling for um, you know first place in the double-handed fleet is is full on. It's it's really something special. With most of the fleet now comfortably ensconced in Cherbourg's capacious Port Chantereine Marina, owners and crews enjoy the welcome they were promised and deserve after completing the first extended route to Normandy. And when no further challenges to their outstanding performance emerge, Tom Means Sunrise is confirmed as overall winner of the 49th Rolex Fastnet race, the first British winner of the event since Nokia Enigma in 2003. I've watched Rolex Fastnet race finishes since I was a teenager, and to even have completed one, I think is an amazing achievement, but to win one is a dream come true. It's been quite emotional as well. There's been some tears. As well as outsailing their rivals, Neen's crew also escaped the clutches of the Ras Blanchard. It definitely affected the outcome of our race. We were very fortunate in that we were approaching at a pretty good time in the tidal cycle. So at that point, you're just very thankful that the lunar cycle is making you look like a rock star. Next time we're off to warmer climbs and Sardinia for the Maxi Yacht Rolex Cup.